Um, it's great to be here, a great honor to speak in memory of Moshe Mayor ben Avram Akoin of Arifka Rachel. Um, and a great honor to speak about the, uh, the, the importance of the land of Israel in Tanakh, here in the land of Israel. Uh, I don't take it for granted that, uh, that we're all here. And uh, I don't take it for granted that on my way here, Waze kept adding many minutes to the traffic. And it took me somewhere over two hours to get here from Gush Etzion, yes. But before you feel bad for me, <laughs> well, you can feel bad for me. But before, <laughs> before you feel too bad for me, while I'm in the car, I'm thinking of the prophecy of Yeshayahu, where we will say once again, Od Yomru uh, Banaich, right? We will say, Tsarli Hamakom Geshali Ve'esheva, right? That's the bracha. We will say, this place is too narrow for me. Move aside so I can have some room, right? So that's, that's what I was thinking about when I was on the roads today and, you know, the traffic was building up and building up. So I do consider it a great privilege uh, to be living in here in Israel in 2023, something that uh, with all of our problems and all of our difficulties here, including but not limited to the traffic, we, uh, we know that most of our ancestors would have not even been able to dream of the privilege that we have living here. And certainly, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, something that is the fulfillment of all of the dreams and aspirations of the Tanakh. And that's what I want to talk about today. You know, when we uh, think about the land of Israel and Tanakh, we, we usually start with Avram, right? Because that's the beginning, or that seems to be the beginning. That's Bereshit Perak Yudbet, right? When God opens this uh, interaction, this ongoing relationship with Avram, Lech Lecha Mertzcha, Mladcha Mibet Avicha, La Eretz Asher Eka, right? Leave your place, leave your land, leave your father's uh, uh, place, leave your birthplace, and go to this land where I will show you, right? And that begins the story of Am Yisrael's quest to set up a nation in the land of Israel and to set up a society, which is a society that is designed to spread God's name. Um, but today I really want to start the story quite a bit earlier in the very opening Tanakh story, and that is the Garden of Eden. Right? I, want to, I want to start there. Um, it is, of course, a very famous chapter. It's an uh, arguably, but I, I think I think it seems that certainly at first glance to be an idyllic story uh, where God creates a world for humankind and places humankind there. And um, the, the, the idea of the world seems to be to create this kind of idyllic, harmonious situation in which human beings live a uh, very uh, successful life, um, and one in which they are constantly interacting with God, whose presence is imminent in the garden, right? We have this sense that God is, um, is, is easily accessible in the garden, <clears throat> but in this very idyllic world of the garden, nature acts to easily provide for human needs, right? So that we have this sense that the harmonious environment in which nature, uh, you know, provides food and 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 uh, and fruit easily for human beings, makes the world a world which is conducive to creating a relationship with God, right? People don't have to spend a lot of time, presumably, working the land. Look at the description that I brought for you here in source number one. This is, uh, this is in, you know, Parak Bet. This is the very beginning of the Torah, which describes the land blossoming easily and effortlessly in the garden. God plants a garden in Eden, right? Look in Pasuk Tet. Vayatzmach Hashem lo kimin adama kol etz nechmad lemareh. V'tov l'machal, right? So God makes blossom in this garden every tree, which is beautiful to look at, but also good to eat. And skip to the next pasuk, to pasuk yud. V'nahar yotze me'eden la'shkot et hagan u'misham yipared v'haya la'arba'a rashim. Right? So there's a there's a, a a river running through this garden in order to irrigate the garden, right? So the garden is already pre-planned, um, right? It's, everything is already growing. And there, there doesn't seem to be very much work to do because there is this river that runs through the garden that is naturally um, uh, irrigating it. <clears throat> and yet, of course, God does give Adam Harishon the task of 
cultivating the garden. Look in the next pasuk that I brought for you. We're skipping ahead to pasuk tetvav. Vayikach Hashem Elokim et haadam vayanichehu vigan eden leovda uleshomra. Right, so God takes Adam and he places him in Gan Eden in order to work the garden, in order to guard the garden, right? It does seem to be that there is some measure of agricultural effort that God expects from Adam Harishon. And yet, at the same time, some of the Parshanim here really ask the question, what is he doing there, right? Everything already is there. The garden is blossoming effortlessly, easily. It's being irrigated by this wonderful river that branches off into four branches and everything seems to be rather effortless. And so Ramban says as follows, look at Ramban in source number two. He says, right? God decreed that in this garden, there are going to be these trees that are just going to always have fruit. La Oved Vizomer. Okay, so Ramban goes off in a bit of a, you know, miraculous direction, right? The, the trees will never get old and there'll never be any, uh, any, any death of the trees. Oh, even if you don't go in that direction, you could still arrive at the conclusion that he arrives, arrives at, which is we don't actually need Adam to do very much, at least based on the description that we see. And then, you know, the Ramban says, and, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the question is, is what does this mean, le'ovda u'leshomra? Um, many of the Midrashim seem to be asking a similar question when they conclude that le'ovda u'leshomra, which is, uh, you know, it seems to be modifying something feminine, le'ovda u'leshomra, and a garden is masculine, suggests that what Adam Harishon is actually meant to be doing in the garden is serving and guarding God and his relationship with God, is cultivating his relationship with God. There are many, many different uh, midrashim that go in this direction based both on the description of the garden and on the words le'ovda u'leshomra. So if you look, for example, I brought for you two examples here. <clears throat> look in the part that I bolded for you in source number three in the Midrash and Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer. Uh, the, the part that I bolded uh, is, uh, is, starts on line one. Ki yesh melacha began eden lefateach u'leshaded et adama velo kol ha'ilanot nitzmachin me'alehen is there really any work in the garden where he has to be plowing and hoeing and, 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 and working the land? It seems like all of the trees are already growing. Skip down to the next part that I bolded. What is he trying? What is he supposed to be doing? Says the Midrash. He's supposed to be all day thinking about God, uh, you know, communing with God, serving God. The, 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 uh, the next source in Bereshit Rabbah is a little bit more specific in terms of Le'ovdal Le'shomra. And it also uses the way in which these two verbs appear in other places in Tanakh. And the Bereshit Rabbah says, what is Le'ovda? Sheshet yamim ta'avot, it's Shabbat. What is l'shomra? Shamor et yom ha-shabbat l'kodsho, right? So the, the l'kodsho. So here the uh, Midrash is saying, what was he doing? He was preparing for Shabbos, right? We know that <laughs> keeping Shabbat is not just a mitzvah of the seven day. It's sheshet yamim ta'avot. That's part of the mitzvah of Shabbat. It's that he is uh, preparing all the time for this experience of Shabbat. And the next opinion in Breshit Rabbah, also based on the words Leuvda and Leshomra, is what was he doing all day in the garden? He was doing Korbanot, right? Which are also referred to as Leuvda and Leshomra. In other words, what the Midrash seems to, what the Midrashim here seems to imply is that the story of God Eden is a story of serving God, right? Now, I mean, I, I, I like the Pshat also, I'll just, I'll just say on a personal level. I like the idea that the agricultural experience is also part of serving God, right? And that is, I think, somewhat connected to some aspects of Zionism as well, but not just because I think we're supposed to build a world, but also because the experience of agriculture is one that prepares us for the experience of serving God. What does it teach us? It teaches us perseverance. It teaches us patience. 
It teaches us that everything has a season, right? It teaches us passion. It teaches us hard work, right? So there's maybe a sort of an intertwining of the pshat and the drash here, but I think that in either case, what, uh, whatever the specific task of Adam is in the garden, what we see is that this garden, which is an exceptionally desirable garden in terms of its easy fertility, its tranquility, its kind of uh, security, the, the prosperity that's going on in the garden, is a place where one can easily find God. And that, of course, is noted in uh, the next pasuk that I brought for you here. And this is, of course, uh, ironically, after Adam Harishon and Chava have uh, betrayed God, have sinned against God. So the pasuk tells us, uh, which is a very kind of anthropomorphic description, right? They hear the voice of God, which is walking in the garden by the wind of the day, right? So God, God's voice somehow, I, I mean, I don't even know if that's anthropomorphic, right? Because it's so sort of disembodied. It's walking around the garden, right? Usually voices don't walk. But the idea is, is that God's presence is very much uh, felt in the garden and that all of this kind of idyllic, harmonious um, uh, backdrop in the garden is designed to create a place where human beings can easily interact with God, which ultimately would seem to be one of the, or, or if not the major goal of, uh, of human existence. In any case, this is a very brief portrayal of an idyllic ex existence because as we know, human beings aren't good with consistency in idyllic existence, right? And it doesn't, you know, just a few psukim that we have where which describe the ideal experience here before human beings sin. This is, I think, <clears throat> almost a kind of a scathing critique of the nature of humans, uh, but one which I think is also part of what is wonderful about the Tanakh because the Tanakh recognizes human fallibility and human weakness from the very beginning. There's a sense of, we know what happens. We know what always happens. This isn't something that happened once. This is what always happens. And yet, and here's, I think, really the wonderful thing about the Tanakh, is that the Tanakh never gives up on human beings, meaning God doesn't give up on human beings. God sets the bar really high. And he recognizes that a lot of times, we're, gonna, we're not gonna reach that bar. Or even if we do reach the bar, we're then eventually going to stumble and fall. And so he gives us a mechanism for correcting that, right? But that's the whole story of the Tanakh, Zil Ugmar, right? After that, we can just go out and learn. But it starts in the garden, right? The garden is the story of what, 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 is, the, what is the difficulty of human beings maintaining a, a, a relationship with God? And what are the consequences of this? And how can we then fix it, right? And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's certainly the, the underlying uh, situation, the foundation of the Garden of Eden story. So human beings undermine this entire world. They betray each other. They betray nature. They certainly betray God. And the world collapses, right? This idyllic world falls apart. God expels them from the garden, but he also imposes curses on the world in order to take away some of these idyllic conditions, which clearly have not produced what they were meant to produce, right? So first of all, what is the first uh, um, uh, curse? Look at source number six, right? Um, no longer does the world blossom effortlessly and easily. God says, um, uh, um, uh, look at, uh, at line number two. Right, the land is now cursed because of you. Right, thorns and, and thistles are going to grow from the ground. Right? It's the same word that was used to describe those um, uh, the God bringing all these fine trees. The word vayatzmach was used, and here instead, you are going to put in a lot of effort to try to make the land grow, and it's going to produce thorns and thistles. Bizeat apecha tochal lechem ad shufchal adamaki menelukachta, right? By the sweat of your brow, you will eventually get bread, right? And so human beings are banished from the garden of God's presence, and there's no more 
Le'ovda u le'shomra, right? If you look at the, uh, in source number seven, the description of the expulsion from the garden, what are we told? Va'yishalchehu Hashem Elokim migan Eden, la'avod et ha'adama. He sent out of the garden to work the land, and this working of the land seems to be a lot more arduous and produces a lot less than what he had in the garden. And the word lishmor also appears in this description of the expulsion from the garden, where we're told, Vayigaresh et adam, right? He, he, he expels a man that's at the end of that line. Vayashken mikedem legan eden et akruvim, right? God puts those cherubs at the eastern entrance to the garden, that la tacherev hamita pechet, and that overturning fiery sword, lishmor et derech to guard the, 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 the path towards the tree of life, right? And so this le'ovdal l'shomra seems to have been kind of corrupted, right? That, that, that idyllic le'ovdal l'shomra that we had in the garden is no longer there. And of course, the, the most significant part is that <clears throat> humans have been banished from this place of God's imminence, from this place of God's presence from this place which was described as kol Hashem Elokim mitalech bagan l'ruach hayom. God's presence was very much felt there. So what, where do we go from here, right? Uh, you know, we had this wonderful garden. We lost this wonderful garden. What should be the next stage in the story? We look for this beautiful garden. That was, that's what you would think, right? And, and here I think is really the strangest part of the story is that nobody looks for the garden. Right? You would think, and we have some very bold Tanakh figures who stand before God and ask God for things and, and are you know, quite uh, presumptuous in their, in their approach to God, right? They're, they're bold. They, you know, Avram comes before God and says, kol ha'aretz, lo mishpat, right? He demands justice from God. And we have Moshe approaching God very boldly. And of course, Moshe speaks to God, panim al panim. And he even says to him, if you're going to do that, erase me from the book, right? You know, there, there are things that happen throughout the Tanakh that suggest that human beings approach God with a certain kind of boldness. I would expect someone, right? Uh, you know, an Avraham, a Yaakov, a Moshe, a David. We have Chavakuk, who's our, our, our early Choni Hamagel, who stands there and says, I'm not moving, God until you tell me what I want to know, right? So any of these figures could have turned to God and said, you know, bring us back to the garden. That's what we want. That's what we're looking for. There's only one person in Tanakh that seems to be explicitly looking for the Garden of Eden. Who's that? Who's that? It's not a positive character. <laughs> It's Lot. It's Lot, actually, right? Remember when Lot separates from Avram? He sees the plains of the Jordan. And of course, it's a well-watered area. And he says, whoa, that's like the Garden of God. Well, for him, the Garden of God is like Egypt, right? In what way is the Garden of God like Egypt? It has a river. It's fertile, it's prosperous. It creates a surplus, a surplus of food, a surplus of prosperity. And that's what Lot's looking for, right? But so there's something obviously ironic about that because his goal is clearly economic and not, he's not looking for God. He's not looking for a certain kind of environment, but no one else searches for the garden. And I think that's really a, a, an omission that requires our attention. Maybe for this reason, by the way, I should have really said this at the beginning, maybe for this reason, uh, Chazal's conception of the Garden of Eden becomes this place that we go to after death, right? Because that's not the Garden of Eden. I, I should have said this at the beginning because I think all of us today are so used to thinking, oh, we're going to Gan Eden, we're, we hope, right? We're trying to go to Gan Eden. Gan Eden is a place that you go after death. But that's not the Tanakh's conception of Gan Eden. Uh, it's Chazal's conception of Gan Eden. Maybe even for, that re for the reason that we have here, which is that Gan Eden disappears. Right? There's almost a sense that it is utopia, right? No place. It's no place. So when do we get there again? We get there again after we die, right? Because it's not anything that we could possibly uh, aspire towards it as, as living creatures, right? So it may be for that reason, but I'm going to reframe the, 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 the question. I think everybody's looking for the Garden of Eden. I think that uh, they're certainly seeking 
the precin idyllic conditions of the garden, but it's no longer called the Garden of Eden. It's now called Eretz Yisrael. Okay, and and, and that that for me resolves uh, the question. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a little bit of time uh, trying to prove that that this is what the Tanakh thinks about Gan Eden and the land of Israel. And then I want to explain some of the uh, so, some of the um, ramifications of this identification. Um, you know, the idea of uh, when God tells Avram to go to the land of Israel, he's sending him to a land, which is then, you know, subsequently it's described throughout the Tanakh. It certainly is the place where God is imminent, right? Where we sense, we are meant to sense, we are told to sense that kol Hashem Elohim mitalech betocha, that God's presence is somehow to be found there. And of course, what do we say every single day in Kriyat Shema? When Am Yisrael properly serves God in the land of Israel. It is a land that produces its fruits easily and effortlessly, right? This is very much part of the story of the Torah is that we're creating an environment in which is, which is designed to respond to our relationship with God. And so when things are good in our relationship with God, the land responds and nature responds. The land throughout the Torah is used as a gauge, right? Also as a tool for punishment, but also as a tool for reward, but also as a gauge, right? A gauge for measuring, are we in a good place right now, right? Are there rains this year, right? That's certainly part of, I remember when my uh, my, my uh, daughter, uh, when she was in Ghan, she's now 27, but when she was in Ghan, I remember her coming home from Ghan, she's my oldest, and she said to me, Ima, it's raining today. That means that Hashem is happy with us. And I remember thinking, because, you know, I didn't grow up where, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia where there's rain and there's, you don't think that's not a connection that you make. And I remember that that was something that was very uplifting for me because that was really a reflection of so much of what the Torah is describing. Um, the, one of the places where I think Parshanim, uh, the, the different biblical commentaries are most aware of this correlation between the land of Israel in its uh, in its ideal in its in in our in our aspirations and the return to Gan Eden is in ironically a section which we're going to read actually I think probably in two weeks uh, in Parshat Bechukotai and I brought it for you here in source number nine it's ironic because it's it's part of the Tochacha, right? Now the Tochacha, of course, Tochacha means rebuke, right? We read it very quickly, we read it very quietly, it's filled with punishment, but it's actually a misnomer. It's really not a good, I think, description of the chapter in Vaikra and the chapter in Devarim, which is described as a Tochacha, because it's not a Tochacha, it's not only a rebuke, it's a breach, right? The first part of both of those chapters start out with, if you serve God, these are all the good blessings that I'm going to give you. And then the next part, which unfortunately I think is the bulk of the chapter, uh, unfortunately a reflection of the human uh, condition, right? Uh, the second part is, is all the curses. So we are, you know, we sort of focus on that and we call it a rebuke. But it's actually not a rebuke it, it, when seen in its whole. It's a breed. Okay, so look at the first part of Vaikra Perak Kavav which is the good part, right? Look at what God says. Right, if you go in my statutes and you, and you keep my mitzvot and you do them. Right, I'm gonna give you rains in the proper time. The land will give forth its produce. The eitz hasadei tain perio. You're hearing echoes a little bit of Canadian, right? The trees of the field will give its fruit. V'hisig lachem daish et batzir v'atzir yasig et zara v'achaltem lachmechem lasova. Right? You're going to eat your bread in satiation. It sounds a little like the reversal of bizeat apecha. Lechem, right? Back in, you know, by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat bread. Well, here we have, you're going to eat bread in satiation. I'll give peace in the land. You'll lie down. No one will be afraid. There'll be no more 
evil animals in the land. It, it reminds us a little bit of, I mean, Yeshayahu Yud Aleph, which we just read, right, on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, right? Yeshayahu Yud Aleph, which is the vision of the lion lying down with the lamb and the child will play by the pit of the viper, right? And, and, and there won't be bad animals, right? Which is, you know, it's a, it's a machloket between the Rambam and the Ramban, whether this is, a, it, this is a literal description, in which case God will suspend nature, that's, of course, Ramban's position. And the Rambam who says, no, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for peace between nations. Well, the Ramban is going to say, he's going to say it in a minute, that this is Gan Eden like right? Remember, in the Garden of Eden, all the animals pass before Adam, right? And, and he gets to give them all names. And there's this sense of hierarchy, right? That the animals are not frightening to the humans. And the Ramban says, Ultimately, that's what we're looking to go back to. So we'll get back to that in a minute. Let's just look at the end of this pasuk. There will be no sword, which literally means there won't be war, right? Amen, right? We hope there will be no war. But it also kind of evokes the end of the Gan Eden story where there was that fiery sword that was churning over. So we have all these kinds of allusions to Gan Eden and perhaps most significant of all, skip down <clears throat> to Pasuk Yud Aleph where God says, V'natati mishkeni betochachem, I'll place my dwelling place amongst you, v'lo tigal nafshi I won't, uh, my, my, I will not reject you, v'hitalachti betochachem. You hear that word, v'hitalachti, I will walk amongst you, right? Kol Hashem Elohim mithalech bagan l'ruach hayom. So we have this kind of restoration of the pre-curse uh, or the pre-sin conditions of Gan Eden. And that's what's promised to Am Yisrael in the land of Israel if they obey God. Now, um, you know, the Parshanim recognize this, as I mentioned. If you look in source number 10, and the words, vihitalachti betochachem, I will walk amongst you. Rashi says, atayel imachem biganeden, keechad mikem, right? I will walk amongst you in Ganeden, right? There's, there's a, definitely some kind of blurring here between the land of Israel and Ganeden. Uh, Ramban says, I think, a little bit in, in a more accurate way, look in, look in a, uh, or in a more precise way, look in, look in source 11, v'hishpati ra'a hachayot min ha'aretz, v'hu anachon, ki tiye eretz Yisrael be'et kiyum ha'mitzvot, ka'asher haya ha'olam mitchilato kodem cheto shel adam harishon. He said, this is accurate. This is, and again, this is what he says also about Yeshayahu Yud Aleph, that there will be some kind of uh, shift in nature, right? In the nature of and the relationship between, you know, some of the predator animals and humans. And we will go back to some kind of primordial state, right? Some kind of early state uh, which, which, which existed before Adam sinned. So that this is a Gan Eden like description. <clears throat> the idea that Eretz Yisrael is a replacement for Gan Eden is a very prominent theme in Tanakh. And you, you're going to see it over and over and over. You've seen it. And maybe some people look at it and think it's more metaphoric. But once you begin to see how often it appears, it, it, it stops being well, it's, it's still metaphoric, right? But it, it stops being uh, metaphoric and it starts being, I think, really an important theme in Tanakh. Why does the Torah start with Gan Eden? Because it's showing us the ideal. Now you're going to ask me, so why didn't we go back to Gan Eden? Why do we need a replacement for Gan Eden? Which we'll get to in a few minutes. I, mean, I think that that is a critical question and we'll get to that question. But I want to show you that many of the Nevi'im use images of Gan Eden and Eretz Yisrael interchangeably, which again, on some level sounds metaphoric, right? You're saying, oh, Eretz Yisrael will be like Gan Eden, right? But I don't, I don't think it is metaphoric. I think it's saying Eretz Yisrael is the continuation. It is the replacement of Gan Eden. Look at this famous uh, prophecy of Yeshayahu. <clears throat> we, we read it during the, uh, the, the um, Sheva de Nechemta, right? Yeshayahu, Perknun Aleph, Ki Nicham Hashem Tzion, Nicham kol chorvotah, right? God has, is comforting Zion. He's comforting all of the ruined places. This prophecy is, of course, about Shivat Zion, about the return to the land of Israel after Galut Bavel. Vayasem midbara 
Ke'eden, right? He made her deserts like Eden. The Arvata, Kegan Hashem, the dry areas, became like the Garden of God, right? So these kinds of things, I, you know, I didn't bring for you all of the different references in uh, the Nevi'im, which interchange Gan Eden and Eretz Yisrael, but you have it in lots of places. I want to I want to just uh, 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 skip over some of the Nevi'im and turn to source fourteen. This is, I think, one of the um, wonderful passages uh, in Shir Hashirim. Shir Hashirim, of course, is describing this love story between Adod and a re'aya, and, and this is really, I think, a climactic moment in Shir Shirim. It's at the end of Perk Dalid, and at, 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 in this passage, uh, the Dode is speaking, right? Um, and he is saying about his beloved in Pasuk Yudbet, Gan na'ul achoti chala, gal na'ul ma'ayan chatum. He says about her, you know, my, my, my sister, my bride, my beloved, She's a locked garden, right? Where do we have a locked garden in Tanakh? She's a locked garden. I want to get inside. I want to go in and, 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 and see this, this, this beautiful garden. I want to experience this beautiful garden. And he describes this beautiful garden filled with fruits. He describes this garden filled with spices, nerd, v'charkom, kane, v'kinamon, im kol atzei halivona. And then in Perakei, Pasuk Aleph, he enters the garden and he says, bati ligani achoti chala. I've come into my garden, my beloved, my sister, my bride, ariti mori im sami. I picked my mirror with the other spices, I've eaten the honey with the honeycomb. I drank the wine with the milk. What does he find when he gets into the garden? I hear an Eretz Zavat Chalav Udvash. You hear it? Right? He finds that land that is flowing with milk and honey. I mean, it has everything in the garden, right? But the chalav, the dvash that are juxtaposed here, they evoke the land of Israel, right? So he gets into this garden, he says, wow, look what I found. I found a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, you know, the, the most, I think, intense experience of Gan Eden in the land of Israel, as it's described in the Tanakh, is to be found in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple. Right. If you know, if if all of the land is a place where God is imminent, well, the temple is a place where it is most concentrated, and there we find the most concentrated descriptions that evoke the 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 Garden of Eden. Right. In the descriptions of the Beit Hamikdash. And by the way, in source number fifteen, I brought you a midrash that says this very explicitly. Vayigarish et Adam. He expelled. Uh, the the uh, Adam Gurash Vyatsami Ganeden. He was he was expelled and he left Ganeden. Vayeshevlo Behar Hamoria. And he sat on Har Hamoria, which is the place of the temple. Sheshar Gan Eden Samuch Lehar Hamoria. Right? The Midrash says, you want to find the, the gates to Gan Eden? It's there, it's on Har Hamoria. So, you know, you might want to look for like a little hidden tunnel to get to Gan Eden, or you might understand this Midrash as saying that going into the Beit HaMikdash is going into that kind of pre-sin idyllic experience in Gan Eden where God's presence was imminent and where you were surrounded with this sense of harmony, an idyllic kind of existence. Now, <clears throat> really throughout Tanakh, we see this. I'll just mention uh, a couple of examples, the Kruvim are the most obvious one. We only have these cherubs in two contexts. One is outside of the Garden of Eden, preventing us from entering. And the other is inside the Beit HaMikdash, sort of welcoming us in to some kind of relationship with God. Right? You know, we think of the Kruvim <clears throat> as being in the Kodesh Kodeshim, right? Uh, on top of the Aron, right? And that's where God speaks to us from, right? So the Kruvim are really some kind of vehicle for relationship with God. It's the replacement. It's the, it's the reversal of Gan Eden, of, of the end of the Gan Eden story. But actually the Kruvim are all over the Beit HaMikdash. 
they're woven into the tapestry and they're um, and they're 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 uh, inscribed into the walls, right? The Kruvim are everywhere, and so the Kruvim seem to be the well, the, the, the opposite, right? The, the healing, the rectification of the banishment from Gan Eden. I'll make one more point about this, um, and, then, and then we'll consider the, the, the point at least proven to the best of my ability for the moment, um, and that is le'ovdao l'shomra. Where do we have those words, right? Look in source number 16. I just found one pasuk which brings both words when describing the mikdash, Right, v'nilvu alecha v'shamru et mishmeret o moed l'chol avodat ha'ohel. Right, these are two words that all the time, as the midrash saw earlier, describe korbanot and what it is that we do in the midrash, in in the mikdash. Right, what do we do in the temple? We do le'ovda u'le'shomra. Right, so there is this uh, uh, constant sense, really, throughout the Tanakh. In the Nevi'im, I didn't even bring you uh, some of the Mizmari Tilim, also seem to have these implications. In the Midrashim, we have a real sense of this kind of awareness that there's this undercurrent throughout the Tanakh that Eretz Yisrael is a replacement for Gan Eden. And you know, I'll mention uh, um, uh, one point that I, I, I saw from uh, that Rav, Rav Sabato made, which is that you know the the the, the story of Gan Eden opens the Tanakh, it opens the Torah. But by the end of the Torah, we actually haven't reached our intended goal, right? And because of, obviously, once again, because of our sins, right? We don't, the, the Torah actually ends without resolution to some degree, because we're on the cusp of entering the land, but we don't, right? I mean, we do in Sefer Yoshua, unfortunately, Moshe doesn't, right? But we are not there yet, right? We kind of end with this like suspended anticipation. It's a cliffhanger, right? But what Rav Sabato recognizes is, look in source number 17, that in this final speech of Moshe, he brings up a lot of Ganadin like words, right? Uh, uh, he says, look in Pasuk Kavzayin, me'ona Elohei kedem, right? God's uh, place is in the east, right? That's a that's a Ghanaian word, right? Uh, God put the kruvim mikedem, right? And and God is going to take you into the land. This is the promise. Vayigareish mi panecha oyev. Look at that word, vayigareish. He's going to banish the enemy before you. It's the fixing of Ghanaian, right? Ghanaian who was banished is the same word. It was Adam that was banished. I'm going to bring you back into Ghanaian and I'll banish all the bad guys, right? So there's this real um, healing of the banishment from Gan Eden, um, right? So that Am Yisrael will live there in security, right? And of course that word Vayishkon also appears at the end of the Gan Eden story to describe God placing the Kruvim so that they, so that we can't go back in, right? So there's this real sense that wherever you look, you're gonna encounter this theme that Gan Eden is replaced by Eretz Yisrael. Um, before I get to the difference, I wanna also just know that there is obviously a very ominous message which is embedded in this inspirational idea, right? And that is, of course, that we know what happens when, when, when Adam betrays God in Gan Eden, right? So there's, you know, etc., etc., et cetera, 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 right? So if you do good, then, you know, then it's all going to, if not, right? Well, we know. We know from the Gan Eden story what happens if not. If you can't live properly in the place of God's imminence, of God's presence, if you can't maintain the kind of relationship that God demands of you, then you will be expelled, right? And this is not something that is, you know, difficult to imagine because it happened, right, twice, right? We had a korban, we had the korban of the mikdash, right? As God builds this mikdash so that we can experience his presence, and when Am Yisrael failed to live up to the expectations of God, the same thing happened to them that happened to Adam Arishon. Now, this is not uh, just, you know, this is not just uh, uh, me recognizing this. The, the, the Midrashim and Echa, which, are, which is a book which is, of course, commemorating the Chorban and the, and the Galut and the expulsion of Am Yisrael from Yerushalayim, from the land of Israel in 
586 BCE. Look in the, the Midrash I brought for you. It compares the whole story of the Chorban to the story of Adam's expulsion from Gan Eden, right? Look in source number 18. Echa yashva v'adad, right? How is the city sat lonely? Kol masha ira la Adam harishon, kach ira li Yisrael. Everything that happened to Adam harishon also happened to Am Yisrael. Adam harishon, he, uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he chenisou l'gan Eden, v'tzivahu, v'avar, v'dano b'shiluchin v'gerushin, v'konein alav. What's the next word? Ayeka. Not Echa, but Ayeka, right? It's a play here on the word uh, uh, Echa and Ayeka, right? What did, what did God do for Adam Rishon? He brought him into the garden. He gave him commands. That's a very important part. And then Adam transgressed those commands. And so he had to be sent away and expelled. And God himself lamented over him Ayeka, right? And look in the next part, in the next paragraph, the Chena Sali Yisrael. He did the same thing to Israel. He brought them into the land of Israel. I'm skipping down to the next uh, uh, line. Vitziva Otam, and he commanded them, Vamarlahem Zot Asu Vichyu. This is what you will do and you will live, right? You'll live very well here. Vizot Lot Asu, and this you will not do. Vavru Al Tivuyo. They transgressed God's command. Vidanam Begerushin Vishiluchim. Right? He, 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 uh, he, he judged them and they were expelled. And then, at the very end of the Midrash, Vayikonen Be'atzmo Alehem Echa. Who is saying the Pasuk Echa Yashva Vadar? According to this Midrash, it's God Himself. Just as Ayeka, which sounds like a rebuke, but it's really a lament because every parent that rebukes a child is really lamenting the child, right? But I mean, the, the, the parallel, I think, is, is, is true. It's important uh, to note this, right? This is, of course, uh, the, the, what we said at the very beginning of this year, which is the Ghanaian story to begin with teaches us the fallibility of human beings and how easily human beings go off the track, right? Uh, uh, fail to live up to the bar that God sets for us. And so now I, I want to explain why we move from Gan Eden to Eretz Yisrael. Because with all the similarities between them, there's one, I think, really very significant difference. And that is what? Rain rain. The rivers, right? Of course, there's no river in the land of Israel. The Jordan's not a river. It's never called a river, right? The Jordan is dependent on rainwater. And we are told, actually, or, or Avram Avinu is told in the Brit Bein Tarim that the maximal border of the land of Israel is Minahar Mitzrayim Ad Hanahar Hagadol Nahar Prat. From the river of Egypt up to, I'm going to say, but not including, right, the, the Euphrates River, right? Uh, uh, the land of Israel cannot have a river. It's part of the theological definition of the land of Israel that is set out by Moshe in Devarim Parakud Aleph when they're on the cusp of entrance into the land of Israel. Look at what I brought for you in source number 19. Moshe says to the people, <coughs> I always think it's, it's a little funny here because right, they're standing there about to go into the land of Israel. It's the 40th year. And, and Moshe seems to be trying to sort of, you know, make sure that people aren't disappointed. By the way, the land that we're coming into, it's not Egypt, right? Don't expect Egypt. It's different than Egypt. But here he also, I think, really defines the essence of the land of Israel as opposed to Egypt. Uh, what happened in Egypt was, Asher right? In Egypt, you would plan things and then the irrigation happened uh, easily by, with your feet, right? You could depend on yourself to make sure that you were going to be prosperous and have a surplus of food. All you had to do was plant the seeds and irrigate using the river and everything would go your way. <clears throat> Even if you had a river, it'd be pretty hard to build an irrigation system. Right? And so you are dependent on the rains of heaven. And therefore, Therefore, it's a place that God always has his eye on it. And I would venture to say, the, even, you know, the, the, the more obvious point is, is therefore our, our eyes are looking toward the heaven. We are waiting for 
the reins. So part of the point, I think, or maybe the main point is, is that it's easy to forget that we are dependent on God when we live in a place of rivers, right? That's, that's the Egypt problem. That's the Mitzrayim problem. That's why, remember, Lot correlated the Gan Hashem with Eretz Mitzrayim. And what, what place did he say was like the Garden of Eden and like the land of Egypt in this regard? Stom and Amora, right? What happens in these sorts of places is that you live in a world in which you think that the success of that world belongs to you because you're looking downward at your own feet, right? Liraglecha, right? Vishkita viraglecha. You irrigate it with your own feet. And so you eventually wind up saying, kochi ve'otzem ragli. Asu You saw what I did there, right? The real pasuk is kochi ve'otzem yadi. Asu right? But you know, the idea is my, my hands, my feet, my human uh, capabilities are what brought to this prosperity. And so it's a land which easily edges out God, right? And so the land of Israel replaces Gan Eden, but with a little tweak, right? It's Gan Eden 2.0, right? It's, it's, it's with a little tweak. There are no rivers. Instead, it's a land where people's eyes are fixated upward, right? We're looking upward uh, for, for the rain, for the source of our success. Um, and, you know, to, just to understand this fully and to sort of bring this sheer to a close, I want to turn our attention to the first place that we actually have rain in Tanakh um, and to see if we can understand why also, what, what rain ultimately does for the land of Israel, the fact that we exclusively rely upon rain. Uh, look at source number 20. This is the first place where rain is mentioned in Tanakh, and it's mentioned in sort of a you know, an awkward context. There's something about this pasuk which has, uh, which is kind of peculiar. The the pasuk tells us, "V'chol siyach asadet terem yeh ba'aretz, v'chol esav asadet terem yitzmach." Right? There's there's not yet uh, foliage. There's not yet greenery. Kilohim tir Hashem al kimala aretz, because God has not yet rained upon the earth. The Adam ayin la'avod et ha'adama, and there is no man to work the earth. Okay, so the, what's peculiar about this is what's the connection here, right? The syntax of the pasuk suggests that God not bringing rain is because God has not yet created humans. So that rain is only for humans, right? Look at what Rashi says here in source 21, ki lo himtir, umatam lo himtir. Why didn't God bring rain yet? Lefisha adam ayin, la avodata adama, right? Rashi makes the, that syntactic conclusion, which seems to be correct, right? Because there's no man yet. The ain mi makir betovatan shal kshamim. God doesn't bring rain until there's someone who can appreciate the rain, right? The rain is not about, uh, is not about irrigation. God could create irrigation in a different way. The rain is about connection, right? The rain is about connecting the earth to the heavens and the heavens to the earth. Look at what Rashi says here. Only once humans came and saw how necessary rain is, did they come and begin to communicate with God. So rain is a vehicle of communication. Now, there's a midrash that 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 tells us that actually, uh, if you look back in source number twenty, the next pasuk is there was no rain, but the edia alem mina aretz v'ishka et kol pnei adama. Instead of rain, they had some sort of moisture that rose up from the ground and watered the land. And according to this midrash that I brought for you in source twenty-two, at first that's how God intended for the world to get its moisture. But then he changed his mind, okay? And the Midrash says, well, why did he change his mind? The Midrash brings several reasons. I only brought for you the, the, the last reason. Look at the Midrash. This is the way the, the, the land originally drank. Right, God changed his mind and said, I want the land to drink from above. 
רבי חנן דה ציפורי בשם רבי שמואל בר נחמן אמר, מפני ארבעה דברים חזר בו הקדוש ברוך הוא. God changed his mind for four reasons, and I'm bringing you the last one. ועוד שיהיו הכל תולים עיניהם כלפי מעלה. So everybody should be looking up. Rain is designed to make human beings recall their dependence upon God. Rain is designed to create communication between humans and God, and particularly in an area which humans are so interested in, which is, of course, economic survival, right? Um, and, and an area which so easily human beings can go astray, right? Because the minute that they are successful, they can begin to think, wow, I created my success. It's a very powerful thing to make the land grow. And so it's extremely important to constantly remind humans that you are not making the land grow independent of God. You need to constantly be looking upwards and constantly be engaged in prayer, in communication, in order to recall that economic success, that survivability comes from God. And that's what the land of Israel is there to teach us. I, I want to show you um, this, this Gemara here in Chulin in source 23 because it brings uh, this idea in, in, in an interesting formulation I want you to see. It's the same idea. But the, the, the Gemara says as follows. Right? It's teaching us that the grass was about to come up, right? Um, and, and it was waiting to come out. But they didn't come out until Adam Arishon came along. And he davened to God, and God sent down the rains, and the, the world blossomed. Lilumdicha. This comes to teach you. Shakadosh Barahu mit ave litfilatan shel tzadikim. This comes to teach us that God really wants the prayer of tzadikim. Why do I like this formulation? Where else do we have the same exact formulation? Anybody remember? It's actually in a disturbing context. It's in the context of barren women. Right? Remember that? The question is, why does God make all the women barren in, in, in Tanakh? Right? And the answer is, because God desires their tefillah. It's the same exact formulation. When, when women read this, this midrash, they often feel the midrash is a little cruel. Right? But when you see it in the broader context, you see something different. There are two types of fertility. There's fertility of the land and there's fertility of humans. And these are two things that humans desire greatly, right? It's about short-term survival, food, and long-term survival, children. And these are two things which can easily make human beings think that they are all powerful. We can bring human beings into the world. We can bring food into the world. We can make things grow. We are all powerful. And so God says, in those two things, I'm going to make sure that you recognize that it has to be a partnership. If you look at Sefer Bereshit, Avram gets a bracha when he comes to the land of Israel. The bracha is a bracha of progeny and a bracha of land. And then what happens in the rest of Sefer Bereshit? No progeny and famine, right? That's, the, the whole story of Bereshit is the difficulty in procuring fertility of land and fertility of humans. Then they get to Egypt. Ah, oh, it's in surplus. B'nai Yisrael, paru, v'yishritzu, v'yirbu, v'yatzmu, b'mod me'ol v'timalei ha'aretz o'tam. It's tremendous fertility. And of course, that's fertility of humans. They have the river. But it's not a world that creates morality. It's not a world where they find God. And Paro, of course, says, Mi Hashem asher shma b'kolo lo yadati et Hashem. We don't want to live in that kind of situation. We don't want to live in Gan Hashem Ke'eretz Mitzrayim. We don't want that kind of Gan Hashem. We want a Gan Hashem where we are seeing God. I think that this is, a, um, you know, this, is, this is an extraordinarily important message for today. It's worthy of reflection, right? In a world where we feel very uh, confident of our human abilities, it's important to remember how our uh, success is dependent on our relationship with God. And that's why, 
uh, Eretz Yisrael is tweaked a little bit. Now, I want to conclude with one final point, which is that I'm sure some of you are thinking what, what I'm thinking, which is that we actually live in, in Israel, which is a slightly different reality today, right? I mean, yes, we still wait for the rains and are excited by the rains, as I said, and my daughter and Gan, you know, excited about the rains, and, th and that means something to us here in Israel. But at the same time, we're, of course, no longer totally dependent on the rains for our existence. I mean, I think it's changed since I came to Israel, right? When I came to Israel, I remember people saying, turn off the faucet, mayim, right? You know, those kinds of, of statements. And today we have five desalination uh, plants in Israel, which are the most, uh, the largest and most successful in uh, on the planet, right? And 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 we're we're good, right? We we don't feel that same sense of existential insecurity. And so I want to conclude with the final thought. I think that the ideal remains Gan Eden. The ideal is the original, right? Uh, Gan Eden 1.0, not Gan Eden 2.0. The ideal is that we should return to this idyllic setting a land of rivers, an easy blossoming, uh, a land in which nature is co-opted to make an easy life for humans so that humans can focus on uh, more significant activities, um, but not lose sight on our dependence upon God. Right? That takes a certain kind of vigilance. Uh, but the reason I think that this might be the ideal is because this is Zechariah's prophetic view of the end of days, which envisions here, I brought it for you in our final source, which envisions a land of Israel with a constant supply of water, a true return to the garden. Zechariah says, bayomahu, mayim chayim Yerushalayim, right? The, the Jerusalem will start flowing with water. Kadmoni, acharon, Summer, winter, flowing with water. That's the desalination plan. Right? It would be flowing with water, but in this prophetic vision, despite the abundant water, we still have managed somehow, or will manage somehow, we're certainly aspiring to manage somehow, to recognize God's supremacy and our awareness of our dependence upon him. Thank you.